So you know how sometimes you're just on your couch thinking, I really have not explored the great graveyards of the Midwest. So you get on a plane to do exactly that. Well, that is exactly what I did. I boarded a plane and I am now at Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio, which just happens to be the second largest cemetery in the entire country and one of only seven to have historic landmark status. Now I know what you're thinking, okay? You're like Malia, the Midwest, like Ohio, like that's not the most interesting place to go grave hunting. But when you look at this cemetery and you see all the homes in Cincinnati in the tri-state area, I'm telling you guys, there's a lot of history here from slave escapes to abolitionists to change the entire course for females, for emancipation. She did a hell of a lot, not to mention all the murders that happened here. Cincinnati has seen a lot, y'all, and we are about to explore all of it, starting with the very place where a lot of them ended up. So let's grave hunt Cincinnati, y'all, and prove that the Midwest has stories to tell. All across the globe, cemeteries and historic buildings are disappearing. The histories and names of those buried there and who lived there are in threat of being lost forever. I am on a mission to tell their stories. This is Grave Hunter. Ah, cholera. Maybe not something you hear often, but if it wasn't for this epidemic, then Spring Grove would have never come into fruition. Cholera hit Cincinnati hard in the 1830s and 1840s, and because of the excess of death, many of the city's cemeteries were overflowing, which made their already poor conditions even less suitable. And if it's not good enough for the dead, then you have to really believe it was pretty awful. So a cemetery association was formed in 1844, and their main hope was that they could find a piece of land that was safe from expansion, had enough acreage to accommodate centuries worth of deceased, and most importantly, was picturesque enough that they could turn it into a park. And they were going big. The inspiration was the perfect Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. They found their perfect piece of land and in 1845, Spring Grove welcomed their very first resident. The cemetery is made up of 733 acres, of which 450 currently contain over 220,000 graves, each one with a unique story. And trust me, there are a lot of good ones here. Undoubtedly, the most famous site at Spring Grove is this. You might think it's a chapel. It's not, although there is one inside, but what it actually is is a mausoleum for the Dexter family, all 20 of them. Built in 1870 at the cost of $100,000, roughly 1 1.7 million in today's money, the impressive mausoleum contains 12 marble catacombs, all containing 20 members of the incredibly wealthy Dexter family. In the mausoleum are a handful of children, some who died of diphtheria, also called the strangling angel of children. Other members died of suicide, a strange bicycle accident, and an accidental fall from a building. My favorite familial story of those buried here is of the two sisters, Annie and Alice, both daughters of Charles Dexter. Annie was the eldest, and when their father died, she was given an inheritance of $700,000, while her younger sister, Alice, was only given $40,000. When Annie died, she left her sister nothing. And so Alice challenged the will in court, basically saying that her sister was a bitch and that she had never shown her any affection. The court actually took her side and she left with more money. You have to wonder how that feud has fared in the afterlife. So fun little not so fun fact, the weather in the Midwest is pretty crazy. And today, as you can tell, it's gonna be off and on raining probably throughout this entire episode. Well, this cemetery has a history of Rain and lightning not being good for the people that are here. In fact, two women over the last couple of years have died by getting hit by lightning. So needless to say, I'm gonna be keeping a lookout. While of course it's romantic to hope that a cemetery this large and beautiful is haunted, the stark reality is more people claim it isn't. If you wanna go down the rabbit hole of local lore, which who doesn't, I did come across a story that mysterious white wolves roam the grounds. To be fair, I was grave hunting for six hours, and besides a creepy groundskeeper who asked to take a picture of me posing with a headstone, didn't see a strange thing the whole time. Naturally, this is not the only cemetery in Cincinnati, but a fun fact is pretty much the entire city is a graveyard. And not just that like, 
of course it's a graveyard everywhere is a graveyard but like literally every time they break ground on a new building they're finding bones and some of those places might actually surprise you the gorgeous music hall yeah this is built over an old potter's field and they keep finding bones last time was in 2016 when they found skeleton bones underneath the orchestra pit not surprisingly haunted the gorgeous park across the street another potter's field this was a cemetery and this school was a cemetery and this downtown corner was a cemetery and this children's hospital was a cemetery and this cute little hyde park playground cemetery Welcome, friends, to the George Shields family plot. Now, this plot is full of a ton of history, a lot of success, and a hell of a lot of tragedy. So we're going to start with George Shields himself, this fella here right now, who was born in 1810 in New Jersey, moved out here with his family, and they all became like masters in the machinist trade. Like he was an engineer, okay? He worked for all the big Cincinnati companies. He was even chief engineer for the Cincinnati Water Corps. So it's like a big deal. He was a super fancy man, except his personal life is not as successful as his career. Before we get into all the tragedy and who all these people over here are, let's talk about all of the Masonic symbols on his monument because it is a lot and they are detailed and they are rare and they are awesome. So off the bat, we have the winged hourglass, a Masonic symbol for how time flies and death comes sooner than you think. And I'll be appropriate one for this plot. This symbol is an incredibly rare Masonic marker and it has a lot going on so buckle up. Basically, the weeping woman is a virgin kneeling at the unfinished temple of Solomon. The broken column, the pillar support of masonry, has broken. The book in front of her is the perpetual record. The urn is full of ashes, and the sprig of cassia represents a grave. The man behind her is time. So essentially, this marker means that patience and presence will accomplish all things. That is according to a mason. Then of course, you have the all-seeing eye, this marker represents the three great lights that surround the Masonic altar. This one is possibly a double symbolic marker since the arm and hammer is also the symbol for the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of New York, of which George was. The last neat rare Masonic symbol is the beehive at the top, which represents industry since bees are natural craftsmen. Welcome to the grave of George's first wife, Eliza, who died at age 31 after suffering obstruction of the womb. So essentially complications from childbirth. They had a son, Edward, who's buried over here, who died at just two months old, only child they ever had. So he's over here and he shares a headstone, little pretty monument. Of course, you have the classic child with lamb, symbol of innocence. This is George's infant sister, Caroline, who obviously died as an infant. Now, if you follow me on this tour, we are going to go meet George's second wife, Virginia Josephine, who also died because of childbirth. So I'm not sure if that child survived, but three of their children did not survive. All of them died, like one died on the day of birth, might have been a stillborn, another one lived to three, another one I think lived to one years old. You have Ida, Edward, and little baby Josephine. George would go on to remarry a third time. She would survive George. He died in, I believe, 1867 after suffering dropsy, which is essentially like heart failure or like a heart attack. So. The family plot, y'all, tragedy. Lots of dead babies, lots of dead wives. Little creepy, little bit of bad luck, feeling pretty bad, pretty bad for the George Shield family. So, wasn't good to be alive in the 1800s. I don't know what to tell y'all. Some people get pretty obsessive about their death. This guy took it to a whole other level. If the grave of Charles Brewer feels a little foreboding, that's because he meant it to be. Born in Germany in 1845, he arrived in America in the 1860s, marrying a young girl named Annie, and together they had at least seven children together. He started getting incredibly wealthy working as a butcher, and then divorced her. How nice. 
He then remarries to a woman named Catherine, and at this point, he's working in real estate, acquiring properties and even more wealth. He has two girls with Catherine, and then she dies at age 36 from pneumonia. It was a real killer back then. Now things are taking a turn for Charles. He starts getting in altercations with tenants, cuts one of them, ends up in court, ends up in court a lot actually, and then he starts a romantic relationship with Georgia, his housekeeper, who his two teenage daughters do not like. He doesn't care, he marries her, and then in 1905, he shoves his daughters off on some neighbors to take care of them, and then takes them to juvenile court in a ploy to essentially disown them so they would never receive any of his properties. This is when he starts really thinking about his own death and becomes incredibly obsessed with it. He buys two copper-lined coffins for himself in Georgia, and they store them, catch this, under their beds, meaning every night they slept on their own coffins. If he doesn't seem unstable yet, this will seal the deal. He loses the case against his daughters and in retaliation, plots a plan to blow up the apartment building his daughters would get upon his death. That goes south, makes headlines, and then he's declared insane, and his wife is now in charge of taking care of him. January of 1908, he writes a suicide letter that he sends to his lawyers, claiming his children were draining him of his funds and he cared no longer to go on. When the coroner arrived at his house, he was alive and well. However, this was the last straw, and Georgia sent him away to Longview Hospital, Cincinnati's premier mental hospital, where he would die in August of that year. The huge obelisk and bronze bust that marks his grave is unsettling, but not as unsettling as Charles originally wanted. His last wish before death was that his eyes be removed and placed in his bust. Why? So he could keep an eye on things. Of course, the eyes that visitors see today are not his own, but glass. The effect, however, to make others uneasy, that, my friends, was accomplished beautifully. How did this woman named Frances Wright, who was born in 1795 in Dundee, Scotland, help change the landscape for females in America and help bring upon emancipation? Well, it's a little complicated. Orphaned at age two with a large fortune in Scotland, Frances, or Fanny as she is more commonly referred, spent her youth bouncing between relatives in both England and Scotland, during which time she became highly educated, well-read, and then started writing on her own. A two-year trip to America with her sister instilled in her a solid viewpoint she would carry her entire life. She published a book in 1821 in England titled Views of Society and Manners in America, in which tons of people read, including Marquis de Lafayette, who ends up becoming a great friend of Fanny's, and together they go to America, where she joins him on many meetings with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. She essentially pitches them the idea to purchase slaves, educate them, then emancipate them, and help them colonize somewhere outside of America. That way, you're freeing the African-American population without threatening the lives of the white population of the South. Imagine lots of air quotes around that. She believed this would be the end to racism, believe it or not, and ended up publishing a pamphlet called A Plan for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery in the United States Without Danger or Loss to the Citizens of the South. And to attempt to prove her plan possible, she purchases a plot of land in Tennessee, a plot of 640 acres, which she calls Neshoba, purchases a ton of enslaved individuals, and promises to emancipate them. This was in 1825. They are not actually emancipated until 1830, when they are then sent off to Haiti. In many respects, her plan had failed. Definitely did not end racism or slavery. She basically just sent them off to another country. I do think her heart, although misguided, was in the right place. She is credited, however, with being one of the forward-thinking people that helped usher in emancipation. She then decides to dedicate her life to women's rights and starts actively lecturing and writing, advocating on subjects like birth control, free education for women, and equal opportunities. She wouldn't live to see any of her dreams realized, but her pioneer spirit in the fight for equality without a doubt played a role in the eventual instituting of these ideals. This is Chunky Singleton. I am not calling her that, that's her actual nickname. She is a favorite here at the cemetery, as you can see with the little tokens and flowers that have been left for her. And her story is a tragic one, but it wasn't uncommon for Victorian age. 
Scarlet fever claimed the lives of over 2,000 children from the years 1850 to 1910. Little Alice Singleton, otherwise known as Chunky, even on her death certificate, succumbed to this awful fever at just age three. Her mother, Tilly, would suffer the death of four other children by the time of her own death in 1918. Spring Grove is the perfect place to spend a day getting to know the people that shaped this area. Join me in next week's episode where we explore the cities these people lived and died. From Cincinnati to Dayton to Covington, Kentucky, our journey through the stories of the tri-state area have just begun.